Hi, good afternoon and welcome. Kat Furlong from PPMD is here along with Dyne Therapeutics. We are delighted to begin to think about what Dyne is bringing to the Duchenne community. And we're joined this afternoon with Dr. Mo Katani, who's the Vice President of Program and Alliance Management. He's the Program Lead on the Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Development Team. And Ash Dugar is with us as well, who's the Senior Vice President and the Global Lead for Medical Affairs. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to, to Mo, and following we will have questions. So thank you again for joining us, and let us begin. Mo, up to you. Thanks, Pat, and good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to thank PPMD for the opportunity to share Dyne's vision with you today. We always feel privileged to be working in this industry where we get these opportunities to speak directly with patient communities. At Dyne, our mission is to bring life-transforming therapies to patients with serious muscle diseases, and at the forefront of that is our goal to transform the treatment paradigm for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD which, as we all know, has profound unmet needs in the current available treatment. This is my least favorite slide today, uh, but I have to show it to keep the lawyers happy. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but in a nutshell, it says that we will be making forward-looking statements that involve <clears throat> risks and uncertainties. And for more information, please refer to our SEC filing. At Dyne, it all starts with our mission. We are laser focused on delivering life transforming therapies to patients with serious muscle diseases, with DMD being a priority. Our mission is core to who we are and what we do every day. The commitment to understanding the community of people living with muscle diseases and DMD in particular, ensuring that their perspectives and experiences are included in our drug development programs is central to our work each and every day. We created multifaceted programs involving community webinars, conference participations, fireside chats, and other outreach to raise visibility and gather input to advance our drug development efforts. Examples include hosting the World Duchenne Awareness Day fireside chats, Dying Rare Disease Day fireside chat this year, and many other outreach efforts to the DMD community. Your voice is important to us. Over the past couple of years, we have been validating our platform and technology, including our ability to target delivery of potential therapeutics to muscle, and have generated exciting preclinical data across multiple indications and disease models, and our focus today is on sharing our data on our DMD program. A dime. <clears throat> We are building Dyne as the leading muscle disease company to deliver for families living with DMD and other uh, muscle diseases. Shown here are four core strengths to help us deliver on that. One, on the far left, we intentionally designed our force platform to overcome the current limitations of muscle tissue delivery with modern organ nucleotides or PMO therapies. The goal for our DMD programs is to develop therapies for multiple skip amenable DMD mutations that increases this different production and enables less frequent dosing to potentially stop or reverse disease progression. Right next to it our focus on, is our focus on rare muscle diseases. We have generated very exciting preclinical data that shows the power of our technology across diseases and in DMD in particular, where we showed significant, significant increase in exon skipping and this different production and meaningful improvement in function in these disease models. And I'll highlight some of these, that data in this presentation. We are developing therapies for multiple exons, rapidly advancing our lead exon 51 program, followed by exons 53, 45, and 44 to reach additional patients. And we are comp completing studies and working with regulatory agencies to prepare for clinical trials. In the third column, you see delivering to patients. We will lever our, leverage our muscle disease focus to advance these uh, uh, programs as fast as we can to the clinic. We have shared that we plan to submit three INDs between end of this year and the end of next year, with our DMD program for Exon 51 anticipated the early part of the timeline. And on the far right, um, you see we had an exceptional in-house and advisory expertise with deep knowledge of DMD and novel therapeutics and a world-class scientific advisory board. For example, our, on our scientific advisory board, we have Dr. Francisco Mantoni, who is a world-leading physician and a clinical trials leader involved in multiple DMT trials. 
We also have Dr. Luke Hunkel, and he's the scientist that actually discovered that the defects in dystrophin uh, are the cause for, the, uh, for DMD. This shot, slide shows and summarizes our course platform. <clears throat> our course platform consists of a specific delivery mechanism called the FAB, or an antigen binding fragment that we have engineered to bind to a, to a receptor called TFR1, or transferrin receptor 1, that is found across the surface of muscle cells. If you look at the Y-shaped structure on the left, that is how a full antibody looks like. Our force platform uses the top piece, the FAB, which drives down binding to the TFR1 receptor on muscle cell walls. We believe FABs have several advantages over full antibodies, including smaller size, which helps with distribution to muscle tissue. The FAB acts as a key, as a kind of a key that unlocks the TFR1 receptor and allows our therapeutic PMO to enter skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle to target the genetic cause of the disease. We link our FAB to the, to the potential therapy, in this case a PMO, with a linker. The linker molecule connects the FAB to the antisense allegal, in this case a PMO which gets in the nucleus to drive exon skipping and is designed to target the genetic basis of DMD. Exon skipping PMOs have been shown to produce very modest amounts of dystrophin and are approved in the U.S. Historically, the challenge, as stated earlier, has been the inability to get, enough, to get enough of these PMOs into the muscle cells to do a good job in skipping and driving dystrophin expression. These are called naked PMOs, meaning they do not have a specific delivery mechanism that helps direct them to the appropriate tissue, in this case muscle. Our force platform is designed to solve the delivery issue and deliver therapeutic payloads into muscle cells by attaching the potential therapy, the PMO in this case, to our FAB, which enables targeted delivery to muscle. This is the advantage of force that will carry the PMO to muscle cells compared to naked oligos or naked PMO. We believe our force platform delivers significant advantages with the ultimate goal to stop a reverse progression of the disease. It drives targeted delivery to muscle through conjugation to a FAB that targets TFR1, as mentioned earlier, and that is a receptor that is highly expressed on muscle cells. This leads to enhanced delivery to skeletal, cardiac, muscle. It targets the genetic basis of the disease, and in, this case, in the case of, uh, of DMD, the goal is to induce skipping of the mutation that is the cause of the disease to then induce the expression of the serum protein. It is redosable therapy, with potential for individualized patient titration. It also has enhanced tolerability due to targeting delivery to muscle and potentially avoiding off-target effects in liver, kidney, and other areas. We have exciting preclinical data that shows prolonged duration after a single dose, supporting a potential once monthly or less frequent dosing. And finally, the modularity of the platform, uh, as we showed shown earlier, where the, the FAB or the antibody and the linker remain constant, but we change the oligo or the PMO. Um, this modularity of the platform gives our platform significant efficiencies in reducing development and manufacturing costs. Our goal for our DMD program outlined on this slide is to build the best in class exon skipping franchise that significantly increases this trim production and enables less frequent dosing to potentially stop or reverse disease progression. Our force platform is designed to overcome the significant limitations of current therapies, and we've generated very exciting preclinical data, starting with our lead exon 51 program, where it, where it exists high unmet need despite approved therapies. This data shown here is from a study with, uh, with our lead conjugate in DMD patient cell line that is amenable to exon 51 skipping. Force achieved enhanced exon skipping in blue compared to a naked PMO, which is represented in red. The naked PMO achieved 25% exon skipping compared to 50% for the dying force molecule. We built, we built on our work in patient my tubes to evaluate the force platform in the MDX mouse model a well-validated mass model of DMD that you see on the next slide.
This slide summarizes the power of our force platform in delivering to muscle and driving significant exon skipping versus what, what has been published on naked or non-targeted PMOs. As shown in this slide, force achieved more effective exon skipping than other approaches in this DMD mouse model. This data shows our force conjugates lead to higher delivery of these therapeutic PMOs to muscles, leading to much better exon skipping in three key muscle types in DMD and the MDX mouse. This mouse model has a mutation in exon 23. Uh, with this mutation, there's no different can run, and it can't run as well as, as it has high creatine kinase in the serum due to muscle damage and has shorter lifespan than a wild type mouse. And this is a standard mouse model that, that people use in the, in the DMD field. This mouse model enables comparison of our force platform in blue squares with published data from a naked PMO in the red triangle and a stereopure ASO or anti science elego in the orange triangle. We observe significant exon skipping in the quad up to 66% after a single dose of force at 10, 20, and 30 mg per kg two weeks after dosing. Not only do we see enhanced exon skipping in the quad, but we also see enhanced skipping in the diaphragm and heart, which are really important muscles for DMD and where other modalities had trouble achieving skipping with a single doses. As you can see for the diaphragm and heart, you barely see any skipping with other modalities versus four, uh, where we see up to 45% in the diaphragm skipping at the higher dose and 35% in the heart uh, at the higher dose. This increase in exon skipping resulted in dose-dependent increase of this different expression that we'll see on the next slide. So exon skipping is the first step. So you wanted to look at what happens after we enhance delivery and skipping. What happens to making this different, the actual missing protein? Once the PMO makes the cell skip the mutation, we should start making this different protein so that the protein can attach to the surface of the cell and do its job and provide support to the muscle cells. This is exactly what we see in this slide. On the left is a western blot, and on the right is a histogram which quantifies the dystrophin levels. Our highest dose of force resulted in 8 to 10% dystrophin with no demonstrated dose-limited toxicity, while naked PMO produced around 1% dystrophin at a higher dose. That's a 40 mix per kg. This is a single-dose experiment, and given that DMD is a chronic disease, we believe that with our redosable, titratable therapy, we can leverage the TFR1-mediated cell entry to redose and continue to build up dystrophin levels. <clears throat> Immunohistochemistry studies conducted four weeks after that single dose demonstrated that we restored dystrophin expression on the cell surface, or sarcolemma, which is important to restore muscle cell integrity and restore function. You can see that in the wild type, as we're staining for, for dystrophin, there's a nice staining on the surface of muscle cells for dystrophin. This goes away in the MDX mouse model that does not produce dystrophin. On the far right panel, demonstrates that force increased dystrophin positive fibers and dystrophin is expressed in the sarcolemma, which should restore muscle cell integrity. Once you enhance muscle cell integrity, we should decrease the amount of creatine kinase, or CK, that leaks out of the muscle when it's damaged. It leaks into the serum, which you'll see on the next, on the next slide, the effect of force on the levels of CK in the serum. So creatine kinase is a clinical bar marker of muscle damage, as we mentioned earlier. Here, a single dose of force demonstrated significant decreases in serum CK at two weeks and four weeks post-dose compared to a naked PMO. If you compare the blue force conjugate with the red, which is naked PMO. This is evidence that we are providing benefit to these muscles and repairing muscle membranes. Subsequently, we evaluated how these data translate to functional benefits. On this slide, we show functional tests showing that dystrophin is actually working on the cell surface to provide the support on function needed. We conducted blinded studies to evaluate functional benefits in this MDX model. On the left is a running wheel test. The y-axis represents distance traveled and the x-axis is time of the day. Between the two vertical dashed lines is the dark period, when mice, which are no nocturnal, 
and active during the night, run on the wheel, as you can see. The gray circles are wild type and mice. The black squares are MDX model, and you see the difference in activities, where the gray cir circles are more active at night when mice are active, but then the, the, the MDX model that has a mutation in this difference is significantly less active. The MDX mice fatigue easily and don't move as much. Force in blue triangles restored function in MDX mice compared to wild type mice. This is not at a single time point as this activity is measured over a 12 hour period. We believe this supports the benefit to skeletal and cardiac muscles since we are enabling these MDX mice to increase activity over a 12 hour period. And as you can see in, in, the, in the red where uh, the, the MDX mice were injected with the naked PMO, uh, there was not much significant uh, changes or improvement in the function, but we see a significant improvement with the force conjugate. On the right, you can see the results of a hind limb fatigue challenge where mice were required to stand for 10 minutes on their hind limbs, and then we measured loss of range of motion. The gray bar is the wild type mice, which loses about 20% of motion, and then the MDX is the black bar, which loses about 70% uh, of the range of motion. And the dying treated MDX mouse is in blue, is equivalent to wild type range of motion. These are very exciting data. <clears throat> At Dine, we are focused on building a global DMD franchise, rapidly advancing our Exxon 51 program, followed by 53, 44, 45 to reach additional patients. We have an opportunity to target up to 80% of the DMD population that's amenable to Exxon skipping therapies and hope to serve as many affected families living with DMD as possible. <clears throat> we are excited by the compelling data in the DMD program that are driving excitement in the field. Preclinically, we have achieved effective exon skipping in muscle. We dose dependently in increase this different expression and reduce CMCK, a clinical biomarker of muscle damage, and we have demonstrated functional benefits in multiple standardized assessments. We have also increased exon skipping versus unconjugated PMO in human DMT myotubes. We are looking forward to finishing our preclinical studies and finalizing our clinical plans for DMT exon 51, which is one of the three RMDs planned in the time window between the end of this year and the end of next year. We also have an opportunity to advance our DMD programs for exon 53, 45, and 44 to reach additional patients. <clears throat> Finally, and this is, uh, this is my last slide today, I can't thank you enough for giving us the opportunity to speak to you. Dying sincere commitment to patients will always guide our path as we build our programs in the company. When Wabi, Beth, Diana, and their families speak to us and share their stories and perspectives, you don't know how much this means to us and how much <clears throat> we appreciate their courage and fortitude. Your feedback makes us better scientists, better drug developers, and better partners, and we feel a tremendous sense of urgency to deliver for individual, individuals impacted by DMD. Thank you again for the opportunity to share Don's compelling story with you today. And, and we'll be taking questions, I think, now. Good. No, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, I, I do have a few questions and would like to go back through the slides a little more slowly. Um, yep. Clearly, the technology is, is new to us, right, as we're used to the naked PMO. So if we could go back to slide five, it would be really helpful. <clears throat> there you go. So, so in general, um, and if I'm making statements that are misstatements, please correct me. In general, what we're looking at is in the approved therapies that we have currently approved, these are PMO, naked PMOs. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And so can you talk about the, the, the TFR1 um, is the receptor on cells. So this is sort of the, the signal on cells to receive, um, mm -hmm. to, to um, accept this new therapy. Cause so can you, so, so these concepts of linker and the antibody and the, the, uh, the FAB target, um, could you just go through that a little more slowly as opposed to the naked PMO, right? The naked PMO is the naked, is that's it. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a naked PMO that is driven that for the most part heads to the liver. And that's why the, the dosing has, has gone up with, you know, the dosing is considered to be increased like it in some of the therapies that are approved. So tell us a little, can you slowly go through the antibody 
that you're targeting, what the linker does, and how this makes this um, sort of boost the ability to get inside the cell as opposed to the liver. Can you go through that a little more slowly? Absolutely, and that's that's a great question. And and maybe we can start with the with the with the PMO, as everybody knows. And and if you look at this slide, um, and, and I can't point point here. If you look at these swiggly ribbons underneath um, the blue and, and and red fab, uh, these are the PMOs. These are the naked PMOs. They're not attached to anything. The challenge with these is once you inject them in the body. Um, they don't go to muscle typically. Um, they are um, they distribute widely, um, and they don't stick around in the system very long. And as you guys know, they they you know they, they get into fluids, you know, uh, and they get peed out or whatever. So they don't stick around enough to enter the cells to get into the muscle. And that's why you have to do so high and so frequently to get that just that little bit that gets into the muscle. In addition, after getting into the muscle, uh, non-targeted, uh, it has to get into the nucleus where it does its function. Now, because of that challenge, Dyn's solution to that is to actually target the PMO. Just take it by the hand, if you will, right? Um, and push it into the muscle, specifically into muscle cells, so that it can go in at higher concentrations and do its job in the nucleus. And this is what we're doing with this fab or antibody against the, the, the receptor. So we chose this receptor, uh, the TFR1 or transferring receptor 1, because it's highly expressed on muscle cells and all skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. And there's data out there. We have our own data um, that shows that the highest expression is really in muscle, so skeletal, and cardiac, and smooth. But it has really, really low expression, almost none, and other tissues, including liver. Um, so we chose that to get to get the PMOs into into the muscle. The way we are taking or, or or making the shuttle to get the PMOs into the muscle is through this fab fragment. So it's a piece of the antibody, um, and it's the piece that specifically binds to this receptor. It does not bind to any other receptor, which is important because if we want to take the oligo to muscle. Uh, we have to have it bind specifically to, the, to this receptor that is on the surface of the muscle cell. And once it binds to the surface, to the receptor on the surface, part of the biology of the receptor is to internalize things. Whatever it binds to it, it's going to internalize it. The normal function of the CFR1 is to uptake transferrin, so that's for our iron homeostasis for the cell. The cell needs it. Um, and the way we engineered our antibody is to bind to a different site on the antibody so that it doesn't affect the biology of the receptor. All we want to do is piggyback. So we're piggybacking on this receptor uh, to take the PMOs into the muscle, and then they can go in and, and do its function in the nucleus. And because the TFR1 is highly expressed on muscle versus other tissues, now once we inject this conjugate, the majority of um, the conjugate is going to go to muscle, and then it will get internalized, and the PMOs can get into the nucleus and do their function by inducing the skipping and then increase this different uh, expression. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's very helpful. So, no, a follow-up, and, and I appreciate that because I think it's, these are very difficult concepts to really understand and think about, and, and obviously not being biologists, many of our parents and our families um, it, it's really yeah. important to understand that cells have receptors, and these receptors can bind to things that help internal yeah. the cell internalize stuff, right? Um, I, yeah. The follow-on question that I have is, um, in general, we are well aware that the PMOs, the naked PMOs, do not you, do not target um, the cardiac muscle, right? They have no effect there, and they don't get in there. Correct. So a follow-on question is the TFR. Is the, that receptor is present in, on the myocardium or the heart, the cells of the heart, and that's why this enables a better um, or an uptake into the heart muscle as well. Is that correct? That is correct. So we, we've looked at the expression uh, of the receptor, and this is a big reason we chose this receptor. It's, it's expression on the, not only the skeletal, but also cardiac and smooth muscle. And you can see that, I think, um, in, in slide nine, where if you compare the naked PMO when you inject it, uh, you can see that you barely do any skipping in the heart, right? Uh, but then right. when you look at our conjugate, 
uh, you see that we can do skipping up to 35%, I think, with, with just a single dose of skipping in the heart versus the others with the naked that barely got any skipping, which tells us that we are getting into the heart just like uh, we're getting to other skeletal muscle and other muscle types, uh, which is really exciting to us because we know how important the diaphragm and the heart are for uh, for, for individuals living with DMG. Yeah, for sure. And I think that the fact that this receptor is also on smooth muscle is very important because as as we know that smooth muscle is affected, um, what we often see is this is more, it's sometimes um, symptomatic in young children, but we, we certainly see um, as they grow older that there are some symptoms associated with the GI and the smooth muscle um, that that certainly can impact quality of life. So the fact that this is targeting cardiac muscle, all muscles, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle, uh, and it and because of using the receptor, the antibody, you're able to get inside the cell more and therefore more expression of dystrophin. Is that a correct statement? Exactly. And and part of the uh, and, and you just pointed a really important point. Part of the rationale we actually chose this receptor is because of its expression on different types of muscle, on all skeletal as well as cardiac and smooth muscle, and that is correct. Good. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to go to slide six. Just the next slide, please. Okay, so you're talking about um, uh, this. I just had a question on. You're talking about the dose. You, you said a statement about you that dose it could be titrated to the patient. Can you explain that? Does that mean that different patients may have different doses, or are you thinking of a, a specific dose that you want to achieve? And I think the second question that I have is <clears throat> the excuse me the delivery is the delivery IV or subcutaneous or what's the what's the delivery mechanism? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, yes, so the, so the point we're making here is this is going to be um, you know a, a drug just like other drugs where you have uh, redosable administration, so you, you'll be dosing mm -hmm. on a on a regular basis, um, and with that. Um, you can dose titrate based on, on the efficacy. And, and we're still in the middle of doing uh, some work preclinically on trying to figure out the dose and dose regimen, right? What is the optimal dose uh, and how does it translate to getting into, into the trial? What I can tell you now, uh, and I'll answer your question as well. So right now, all the studies that we've done in the animal, these are IV injections. And we envision that we're going to get in the clinic uh, IV injection for now as well, because that is to us the fastest path to get to the clinic. And that's what we want to do. We want to move this as fast as we can uh, to, to get to the clinic and help and help these patients. In the preclinical data that we have so far, we have support um, for a dosing frequency of once monthly, at least, or even less frequently. And right now we're in the middle of um, conducting these studies that would tell us exactly how often and what is the dose. But we believe it will be at least once monthly or maybe less frequent, depending on the on the data that we're waiting on. That would be terrific. Um, certainly, yeah. um, less frequent injections would be obviously ideal and less burden significantly for the patients. So we appreciate that and we'll look forward to further data on that issue think about the clinic and your dose finding studies. So the next slide, um, slide seven, please. So, you know, in this, you know, we know that the PMOs and, and obviously the, the expression has been variable across patients. So I don't think we can make a blanket statement that, that says patients on PMOs are only getting a certain percentage. But I, I think we can say that in the PMO deliveries at the therapies that we have online right now, it's not above 10% expression. Um, so when you're thinking about expression, you can you give us a thought of where, you know, and this is probably a crystal ball question, and I apologize for it ahead of time, Mo, but where where do you see this landing? Do you see it landing much greater than 10% um, or just getting above that mark, or how do you see that based on the animal studies that you've done? Yeah, I mean, and I've showed you some of the data. Thank you for that question. And I've showed you some of the data uh, in this animal model. And um, obviously, the more, the better. And, um, you know, when, when we're looking at the data that we already have, and we have more studies ongoing to to sort of laser focus specifically where, where, where we're going to be or where we want to be, um, if you look at the data we have so far and we've showed today, a single dose 
is getting us eight to ten percent, right? Um, and that by itself, I think, is is a huge advantage uh, to go there. Now, keep in mind that this is a single dose, and because of the half life of dystrophin, so how long once you make dystrophin, how long it stays, right? And there's data out there, and the data we're generating that it stays on the surface uh, at least maybe two to three months, right? So you can see when you, you do one injection, you produce certain percentage of, of dystrophin, eight or ten percent, etc. That dystrophin is going to stay there until you, you get the, the next injection, and then you'll have more dystrophin. So it's reasonable to say um, that that would be in the range that we want to we want to be, and and there's of course chance that we want to we want to have higher, right? Uh, but based on the data that we have now, you know, at the highest dose that we injected, a single injection is giving us eight to ten percent, which I think is really exciting based on based on the preclinical data as well as as, as patient data out there, uh, where they looked at, at different uh, mutations with different variability in in, in expression, uh, where I think ten percent um, and higher will will be really beneficial for the patients. Yeah, I think in general the conver- the the usual discussion is, you know, you you really sort of bent the curve dramatically if you get above 10%, right? And and so that's sort of the the optimal guide. And when you're talking about the half-life of dystrophin, you're saying that, you know, on a single dose you get some dystrophin expression, so that will hang around or last for a period of time. And so you you would like to continue that and and accumulate dystrophin so that um it builds, and that could be a, a place where it would get much greater than 10% um, at the single dose level. Is that correct? That is that is the idea, is this this idea of accumulation. I and mean, we're in the middle of doing these studies with multiple doses, et cetera, that is going to show us that. Is that going to be uh, 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 where we're going to end up, which is the accumulation of dystrophin, et cetera? We're actually in the middle of, of these studies, and we can't wait to actually look at the data. But so far with the single dose, the, the data is really promising. Yeah, well, we're very excited to see this come forward, and certainly with, you know, potentially less burden to patients, greater expression, and certainly targeting the heart and, scale and smooth muscle. Um, as you say, we we are talking a lot about smooth muscle these days, especially in our adult population, and, and in the certified centers bringing in uh, the GI folks to to listen to some of some of the issues that these little guys have. Sometimes it's bladder insufficiency or urgency. Sometimes it's uh, uh, GERD, as you know, they have reflux, and certainly steroids increase the reflux. And then there's motility issues in terms of digestion and elimination. So I think really trying to improve the quality of life of the all muscle, right, skeletal smooth and cardiac, is really where we want to go. So we're really pleased with that. Could we go now to slide, where are we? We're on slide eight, please. Thanks, Pat. And, and just to add to that is, is as I mentioned during, during the talk, um, is, is listening to the patient community, listening to the needs, and I truly mean it, makes us better scientists and better drug developers because we want to develop something that is meaningful. And part of that, like you said, it's, it's not only skeletal and cardiac, but also it's the smooth and the GI, and we're looking into that as well. Yeah, Mo, I think, um, first of all, this this community is really a, an incredible community with its breadth and its expertise and its its commitment to each other and, and to sponsors like you all making drugs. I think we can also say that they want safe and effective drugs, right? And and yep. obviously we want therapeutic opportunities, but if they don't work, I, you know, the long haul is we want something that's really safe and effective. And, um, and, and obviously we know as fields improve, um, we get, you know, more effective drugs over time, which is which is the whole goal to be able to treat um, all aspects of this disease, and it's, that's really important. Um, I just w- wanted to make a comment here about the naked PMO and and your work in the mice. I think one of our concerns, or one of our expressed concerns, is is in mice we sometimes see different things than it doesn't translate exactly the same to people. Like when you show the mm-hmm. naked PMO at 20%, you know, in the mice it did 20%. In people it doesn't quite get there. So um, mm-hmm. are you doing larger animal models or, or how do you expect the transfer from animal to human to be with the antibody? Do you expect it to be good based on using uh, um, the, the antibody and the targeting of muscle? 
Yeah, I mean, this is part of all the the preclinical data that we're conducting right now, and it's part of the whole uh, development program that's going to allow us to follow our R&D and get into the clinic. It's it's all it's it's part of the program of of testing in in larger animals and figuring out the safety range and all of these that, that are planned that are ongoing to enable us to to um uh to follow the R&D and open the clinical trials. So that yes, so we're testing in 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 other models, not just this one MDX model. Uh, and we're also planning and, and testing in in, in larger um, animals, uh, will, which will enable us to to look at the safety as well as the, the efficacy. And that also helps us in building these models of how how this skipping and, and this different et cetera is going to translate to the human, uh, based on the multiple studies that we're going to uh, we conducted and are conducting, and then taking that data and building that model to increase our our confidence in what um, what we're going to see. Um the the one thing I want to add here as well is um since we're on this slide and we do see twenty percent in the naked. And I don't want to get mm-hmm. too technical here, but um in patient so in DMD my tubes in patient cells, when you take them out of their context, out of the body and you put them in a dish and you look at them, um it, and this is, has been known in the field. Um, they're they're pretty leaky in the sense they let PMOs in more than when they're in the body, right? It, it's a different environment. Right. They're they're isolated, etc. And this is where you see this 20% with the naked PMO. Now, if you look in vivo and you inject naked PMO, single injection is not going to get you that, right? So this is just the system and the limitation of this system. This is something that we need to do just to show that our molecule works on the human receptor, right? This is these are human DMD myotubes, um, right. that the conjugate works on the human receptor, it gets in and, and, and does its function, you know, the how much, I think that the system has limitations, and this is why we do multiple studies in preclinical models in small animal and large animals just to get more data to build that um, that model to help us in the translation to the human. Yeah, no, I think you raise a, a very good point and probably one we could spend a webinar on with you and other biologists to talk about, you know, uh, looking at cells and culture versus uh, various animal models yeah. versus people and what, what the limitations other than uh, if the limitations of the model are because cells without being in the biological environment with all of the, uh, all of the environmental issues and milieu and cells in, inside a human body, it's far different when you have them in a petri dish as opposed to an animal model as opposed to a human being, right? So I, I think that that probably would be a, a very good um, uh, talk for another day that we can talk about what the limitations are, why you do it, and what the limitations, known limitations of each model would be, um, and what you gain from each of those models as a stepwise um, process. So I'm really pleased about that. And, and as I say, we may call on you for exactly that kind of a conversation a little bit later. So if we go to slide 12. Um, and this uh, this is about the, the CK, I'm pretty sure my notes are right. Yeah, so CK has always been curious to all of us. Um, we're well aware of um, CKs at baseline often being in the tens of thousands um, and on mm-hmm. injury going way above 50,000 sometimes, depending on the extent of the injury. Um, and I, I, this is just a curiosity curiosity type of question, Mo, would you see as, and I'm guessing this is going to be the case, if you can get expression with X dose, whatever X dose turns out to be as you do your clinical studies and dystrophin accumulates, you may see a stepwise decline in the CK over time, right? So you might get a drop with the first dose, and then as Mm -hmm. the dystrophin expression accumulates and builds over time, you may see a continuous um, decline in the CK. Would you agree with that? Yes, I mean, I, I would. Uh, I mean, that would be the expectation. Yes, and um, I don't, you know, we can't read too much into this this data, right? But if you look at the right. levels at two weeks versus four weeks, right, and you see it a bit lower in the four weeks than the two weeks, that is an indication that you know maybe more muscles are are being um, you know fixed, have the integrity, and now you have lower lower CK, right? Uh, it's not direct evidence. Uh, but this would be the the, the readout from this and the expectation. Right. So I hey, think Mo? that yeah, I know when. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. Go ahead, Ash. Oh, hey, paint hey, Pat. Hey, Mo. Um, sorry to sorry to interrupt. Yeah. 
just a one, no, one type of dash. Just one comment on the CK. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll see that kind of uh, sustained decline that you're talking about. Um, uh, as you know, as many of you know, um, what has been seen in other clinical trials is this sort of, um, you know, decrease, you know, uh, you know, comes back up, goes back down. So CK, as you know, in and of itself, as a measurement, can be quite variable and jump around. Um, but over time, uh, you know, of course, the, the expectation is to see a, a decline in CK. It just it tends to jump, you know, um, pretty uh, pretty robustly. But over time, it should be a sustained decrease. Yeah, thank you, Ash, for that. I, you know, um, sometimes as parents, we hang on to that CK, but you're right. It can change with activity. It changes, you know, the time of the day that you drew that CK and what activity has been associated mm-hmm. with it. Or, um, you know, I, I know that when my own sons were here, if, um, that what, I can't remember who said this to me, but if you kept them in bed the rest of their life, the CK would be lower. And I thought, well, that's not <laughs> ideal, but thanks for that <laughs> comment, right? So, but, but, you know, I think, if you, over time, are seeing a reduction in the maintenance of that reduction over time of the CK, uh, I mean, I think that that's certainly, it, it's not the factor to tell you a great deal, but it is certainly a reassuring um, factor for families to see the CK that was once 20,000 coming down to two or 3,000, not that you would like it to be in the normal range, but that certainly does um, make us feel um that there's some real light in this tunnel. And so I think we all are much aware that it varies, but at the same time looking for a decline over time. So thank you for that. Um, slide 13, please. So uh, my my question was here is, are, do you, can you tell us what the single dose here, and is that translatable to human beings, or is that a whole different criteria when you're thinking about dosing human beings? Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, as, 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 as you're seeing on the slide here, this is the single dose that's the 30 mix per kick, which is from mm-hmm. the dose response that we did earlier, that's the, the higher dose. Um, I can't, right now we're in the middle of building that model, and there's a lot of information that we need to feed into that model, including this study here, as well as others that we're conducting and planned to tell us what would be the equivalent dose in in the human? But where, where are you going to have your your starting dose in the clinical trial? Uh, you know how far you want to go up. This is still work in progress as we as we finalize our clinical plans and as we get more data to actually feed into the model uh, to give us confidence in where we want to be um, in the clinic. Yeah. So I just didn't know if there's a sort of a, a an algorithm you use to translate a dose from mice to people or. Or is the, are there lots of contributing factors to get from one dose to the next? There, there is a. It's called a, a PK, PK, PKPD modeling. It's, it's like an algorithm where you feed it a lot of information, including the dose that you've done, including the the models. You know how much they weigh, their lifespan, all of these information. So you feed it into that model, and and, and the more data you have, the better. Uh, so that at the end of the day, there's a prediction on what would be uh, the best dose that, that to start your trial and how you scale up. And even during the clinical trial, you take the data from the clinical trial and feed it back into the algorithm or, or model to improve it to actually help you with the next dose and the next dose. Great. Thank you for that. And, and now if we can go to slide 14. All right. Um, we have seen this slide as a community before where approximately 80% of the patients could be treated with anesthesia mm-hmm. um, or with its approaching and express dystrophin, um, which is uh, for many of us um, similar to the holy grail, right? Dystrophin is absent and getting it back should be meaningful and, and certainly should bend the curve and change these lives considerably. And that's where we're going. But you're starting out with Exxon 51. You've mentioned 53, 45, and 44. Do you have a, mm-hmm. just a ballpark timeline? Um, as you know, every second counts here. So do you have a ballpark timeline about when those would roll out, and could they potentially roll out in parallel? Um, th- this, is a, this is a great point, and, and 
that. I mean, we're, we're trying to move as fast as we can, and, and um, we realize that urgency and, you know, time is of the essence for all of the patients. Um, we're moving, you know, our lead program is the 51, and then I would say the next three, uh, we're still working on them that can be moved um, together. The the I would say the biggest thing in how we are moving these these molecules, as you guys have seen, the antibody and the linker are constant. So these this is the platform; it's constant. What changes for these mm-hmm. mutations is the PMO, the specific PMO. Okay. Well, you mm-hmm. need to to pick the most effective PMO. So we found the 51, right, and we're moving it as fast as we can. Right now, we're in the process of finding the best or most effective uh, PMO for the for the next three exons. And once once we found those, we can just attach them to the antibody linker, and then we can start the program, right? The development program, making sure it's safe, studying in animal models, studying in, in higher species, and then getting all the data that you need to get to to the IND. So right now, what can I, what I can tell you is, um, work is 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 advancing as as fast as we can. Uh, for Exxon 51, where we'll, we'll be filing an IND, uh, towards the earlier, um, uh, timeframe that I gave you between the end of this year and, 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 and the next year. And then the following exons are still work in process to, to, just to find, um, to find that most effective oligo. And then we can start, um, the development program, uh, and we'll be happy to, 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 to come back to you guys and share with you where we are with the other exons. Thank you, Mo. And from a regulatory perspective, um, um, for both you as well as Ash to comment on this, you know, you, you have, as you just mentioned, that platform is constant, right? Those pieces are going to be constant, and you're attaching the PMO that's specific to skip the relevant exon. So um, so that goes for any exon A through 5643, all of them will target heart, skeletal muscle, and smooth muscle with your platform. But are there any regulatory um, – so once you've demonstrated the, um, the X on Exxon 51 safety and efficacy, are there any modifications from a regulatory perspective that could be made to advance the next three more quickly? And, and for that matter um, – so this is a several-part question. For that matter, you know, we keep talking about these 80 percent of the patients, but I have not seen anyone come out on Exxon 8 or 56 or 43 or 42 or 50, right? So these um, families whose children or people who are amenable to those skips have been waiting for, uh, I think it must feel like a lifetime. So how are we going to get there more quickly? Is there a regulatory uh, approach that you think would be useful? And how quickly will you get to the um, the exons that, that really apply to fewer and fewer people in the population? Yeah, thanks, Pat, for that question. Maybe I'll have a quick comment, and then um, maybe I'll ask Ash to add to it. This is a this is a fantastic idea, and this is something that it's on our mind. How can we move the first program as well as the one following more efficiently and faster? And this is something that we want to we want to as we move progress and take 51, and then start working on the others. Uh, we want to have discussions with the agency about how can we build a more efficient path. To getting to to the clinic and to approval, uh, so this is really one of the top of mind uh, that we have, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll stop here and let Ash um, add if he wants to add anything. Sure, yeah, I don't have much more to add. I think Pat, um, it's um, it, it's top of mind, you know, for us as well, and um, you know, we're we're going to work very closely with uh, with the FDA to try and. Uh, determine the most expedient path forward for the 51 skip amenable program um, and and also continually learn from from each program so you know learn from uh, you know how we approach 51 skip amenable population uh, and then apply that learning to, to, to the next program and the next program and so hopefully working closely with regulatory agencies we can uh, you know formulate a path that gets us to um, approval as quickly as possible. We know there are patients that are waiting for all of these drugs, and the more, and you know, we all we all want more options for patients, and you know that's very important to us. Um, the more options for patients, uh, the better it is for everybody. And, um, and so we're really going to partner with with regulatory bodies to try and move as quickly as possible. Um, and as we have more information, we're going to share more information on our clinical trial plan, 
Um, and we're also going to want to partner with you um, and, and the patient community in actually um, informing our trial design, and, and we started doing some of that already. So, so um, you know, that's what I can offer, you know, at this point, um, and we'll keep keep coming back to you with more information as we have more information. Okay, thank you. And then you've listed these, you know, you've listed the 80% that are, are known and certainly identified. Are you thinking of in terms of it, like if there's a single exon duplication, like in a dupe 2, can you, could you theoretically develop an antisense to take out a duplication of a single exon? Um, yeah, I mean, we've been thinking about I mean, theoretically. Um, go, ask, do you want to take that or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm happy. happy. So, yeah, so theoretically, I think Mo and I were going to say the same thing. Theoretically, it is possible to, um, to be able to, um, uh, address uh, a duplication, a duplication of 51, for example, or a duplication of 53 or two. So, um, you know, theoretically, it is, it is possible. Sorry, Mo. I, I interrupted. No, I was going to say the same. <laughs> and, and now I have just a, a, a few uh, sort of um, question, crystal ball kind of questions that I, that I would love you to just comment on and think about. One is um, we've, you know, while this covers 80% of the patients, there are patients that would be, um, that would, could be treated with combining two different exons. Um, are you doing some of the work around that? I know that in our space, they, you know, with the with the current four approvals, you theoretically could combine a 45 and a 51 uh, on some, obviously not on all patients, patients who are amenable to get back in frame with that with that um, skip. How do you? I mean, how do you think about that, or are you thinking about that? And what work would need to be done in order for all of us to feel comfortable um, combining these therapies? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and I can tell you that, yes, we are thinking about that. And um, one of the things we're thinking about is, you know, if you look at the platform with the antibody and the linker, um, can we link two different PMOs to target two different exons in one molecule, right? And that would be the molecule that, that would del- deliver on these two different exons. So we've been thinking about that. You know, the next step uh, the steps for us is to, um, to figure out what that's possible, right, to actually do the experiment itself. Uh, and that's what would be in the future. And, and as we progress and, and generate more data on that, you know, in science and in drug development, et cetera, it all, it all starts with an idea. Uh, and this is where we are now. And it's, it's just a matter of doing, uh, collecting all the pieces needed to conduct the experiment to actually show that that's possible. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very important to our community to look at other exons that might be amenable, um, you know, as as cross your fingers here that this platform is successful and and can be generalized mm-hmm. and there are regulatory pathways that aren't don't take years and lifetimes to get across the across the, uh, the regulatory process. But I guess another question that that I have on my mind is what if as we think about the future of children in a gene therapy study and there's a microdystrophin mm-hmm. on board and they're amenable to skip whatever that you that is approved. Um, uh, do you suppose that that, that um, expressed in-frame protein would compete with a microdystrophin, or would it support or be complementary to a microdystrophin? Um, how how do you see that going forward, and what do we need to learn to be able to figure it out? That's a really good question. So, um, I mean, no, go ahead, Ash. No, no, Mo, I'm sorry, please. No, no, go ahead. I, I have an idea, but um, go ahead if you want to if you start. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll start. So, um, so thanks for that question, Pat. Um, you know, we 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 would envision that um, you know our DMD program could be used uh, for uh, you know as, as monotherapy, if you will, for um, for for the appropriate skip amenable patient population, uh, or it could be used, you know. Um, in combination with gene therapy, at least that's that's what we envision. Um, I think some of the limitations that are known right now with current AAV gene therapy are around, you know, questions around durability, uh, pre-existing immunity, um, sort of these variability in the safety profile and and off-target delivery, and also just manufacturing issues. So, so I, I think that you know there are um, aspects of um, of uh, this platform.
form that um, has, you know, the ability to overcome some of the potential limitations of, of AAV. Uh, in terms of how they might work together, I think that work is, is ongoing. There, there are a number of um, labs and, and uh, 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 that are working on understanding how exon skipping therapies and gene therapy might work uh, in tandem. And so I think as those preclinical studies um, are conducted and come to fruition, uh, we'll have a better idea of how the two, you know, can be used. In, uh, in combination. And, and just, just, uh, just to remind everybody, um, the, the technology that we're talking about here, um, is, is designed, uh, to pre- produce a, 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 you know, a truncated but functional form of dystrophin. Um, and then of course the AAV, uh, based gene therapies are, um, are looking to produce a, a micro, uh, dystrophin. Uh, and so, you know, your question around will they compete with one another, it, it's not clear, um, but there, there's, um, you know, again, those studies are, are ongoing. And I think um, everyone hopes that there's a place um, for, um, I, you know, I'm confident there's a place for, for both exon skipping and gene therapies. And then I think some of the studies will pan out on, on how to combine the two. Yeah, I, I, I hope so as well. And um, I think that you know, with these early days with gene therapies, and and I, you know, I certainly would want to look holistically at this child and make sure that um, all individuals involved have the best opportunities and as quickly as possible. So um, I think that um, the more we can learn, and, and certainly as a community, the more we can support you to learn or or do supplemental studies with wherever and whatever, we would certainly be willing to do that. Um, there is one question that's coming around the COVID vaccine. Um, I, you know, I think we can say that the vaccine does not interfere and will not interfere with a therapy such as this. But um, Ash and Mo, if you will comment on on that, just to reassure our families that uh, having a COVID vaccine certainly doesn't interfere with an opportunity for treatment in Duchenne. You are right that um, our treatment, um, just like any other therapies, and, and you know titrable injections, it, it, it does not interfere if, if people took their uh, their COVID vaccine. Absolutely not. Good. And we certainly recommend everyone to get the COVID vaccine when it's available to them. And, and the studies are ongoing with children under 16, at least. Um, there are studies uh, that I know of around the world um, with the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna that um, getting a younger and younger age. I'm not sure about the other vaccines, but I'm certain everyone's going to study younger populations. And, and I wholeheartedly recommend uh, getting the vaccine um, and yeah. and getting hopefully the day will will happen soon that this world opens and we can all be together again <laughs> but with with that yeah. I think we have no more questions and we're right at the hour um, for Mo and for Ash thank you very much please know that time matters and we're so grateful that you're in our community and you're moving forward to the extent that we could be helpful in terms of regulatory and trying to work with NIH and FDA and other uh, regulatory agencies to try to move the, the platform forward, um, and to the extent that we could encourage you to look at these exons that uh, that are really um, applicable to a very small, much smaller population, exon eight, etc. I, I think um, all of these families need and deserve um, treatment, and the faster we can get it to them, the better. So we wish you the greatest amount of success. We look forward to another webinar with more data and hopefully very soon a protocol that says you're um, coming into the clinic and uh, this is the first step. So we look forward to that. And thank you very much for all of you who joined us. Thank you very much for coming. Um, We so appreciate all that you do for all of us. We appreciate the families and the value that they bring to each of us personally and to all of us collectively. So thank you. Happy spring. Um, Hopefully the world will open and we'll see each other in person. Thank you for joining us.